Hello, everyone, and welcome to Question Lab. Tonight's topic is vaccines. We'll be dissecting four questions on the topic of vaccines tonight, and we're happy to have you here. Leading our discussion tonight is Dr. Boris Vakaria, and he's going to introduce himself to you now. Boris. Thank you, Sean. Hey, guys, my name is Paris. I'm a current dermatology resident here in Dallas, Texas. I originally graduated from pharmacy school and then went on to do further medical training. Um, I'm also an RX coach with USMLE RX, so I work one-on-one -on -one with students such as yourselves to help prepare you guys for the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK as well. Um, and tonight, uh, happy to be leading the session on vaccines. I know I mentioned RX coach earlier. RX coach is our one-on-one -on -one coaching and tutoring program. We'll talk more about that later. But what I want you to know for now is that the methodology we will employ this evening as we dissect these questions is very similar to the methodology we use in our coaching sessions. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into our first question of the evening. Now, as you can see, the answer choices are covered up. That is by design. We do that because we don't want the answer choices to guide or dictate your thought process. And we don't want you to see an answer choice that you are unfamiliar with that may cause you to panic as you're trying to rush, uh, answer the question on test day. So I've gone ahead and covered those up and removed those for you. After that, we'd like to begin with the lead in or the last sentence itself. And the reason we do that is because we want you to know what the test writer is asking so that as you're reading that vignette, you can pick up on all of the relevant clues and not have to waste time rereading that question on test day. So let's go ahead and begin with that lead in now. Which of the following organisms is most likely responsible for this patient's illness? Which of the following organisms is most likely responsible for this patient's illness? Now, after we do that, we like to ask our students how many steps they believe the question will require. An example of a one-step question is when you're asked for the diagnosis. An example of a two-step question is when you're asked for the treatment for a diagnosis. And an example of a three-step question could be where you're asked for the mechanism of action for a treatment for a diagnosis. So with those examples in mind, please let us know in the question box how many steps you think this question will require. And we do that because we want you to have an organized thought process and not make any careless mistakes on test day, but also to make sure that you answer the right question. All right, I see some responses coming in. So let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A one-year-old girl is brought to the emergency department because she has been crying more than usual and refuses to eat. She has not seen a physician or received any vaccinations since birth. Temperature is 39.4 degrees Celsius or 102.9 Fahrenheit. Analysis of the cerebrospinal fluid shows opening pressure of 187, white blood cell count of 1256, protein level of 210, and glucose level of 31. We want all of you to start thinking about the most important and relevant clues in the vignette leading as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and show you what we think are the important uh, clues in this vignette and the lead-in, okay? So usually when you get a clinical question like this, the first thing they're gonna give you are demographics. And in this case, they give us that this is a one-year-old girl, okay? So automatically we're thinking more of an infant pediatric case, okay? Now we know the topic is vaccine, um, uh, so we'll, you know, we'll talk about that in a second, but when these clinical questions, they'll often next tell you, you know, why are they coming to the hospital? Why are they being seen by the physician? And in this case, it's because she's not eating and she's crying more, okay? A lot of times they'll also tell you how long it's been going on for, you know, a few days, a few years, so you can get a sense of, to the chronicity. Now, in this case, we also know that there's a few other important clues. Hasn't seen a physician, hasn't received any vaccine since birth, okay? And you can see there, they give us some CSF findings. Whenever you have CSF findings, always want to make note of all of the values because that can help clue you in as to if anything is abnormal. And if so, which, uh, what kind of abnormal is it, okay? Now, we knew after reading this lead-in that this was talking about an organism, okay? Specifically, an organism most likely responsible for the illness. So I think we've got a couple steps here. I think, one, we've got to figure out what is going on with this patient? What's the diagnosis? And then two, um, what organism might be causing that? There might be another step in there, but I think as of right now, um, a two-step question is a good bucket to put this in. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the, uh, the next slide, the answer choices. And what we're gonna do is as we go through these answer choices, we're gonna walk you through them, starting at the bottom and working our way up to the top. So starting with E, and going up to answer choice A. And the reason we recommend students do this is because 
a lot of times we'll see students who start at the top, they'll see something they like, and they'll select it without going through all the choices. So sometimes they'll get that question wrong. So we recommend doing it this way to prevent yourself from biasing yourself. So let's go ahead and do that now. Answer choice E, listeria monocytogenes, D, herpes simplex virus, C, Haemophilus influenzae, B, group B streptococci, and A, E. coli. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer here and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Well, thank you very much, Boris. The poll is open. Once again, we're gonna wait until about two thirds of you have responded. Keep in mind that all of your answer choices are anonymous and you should never leave a question blank because there is no penalty on test day for leaving uh, for incorrect answers. Only correct, uh, only correct answers will get you points. So there's no penalty for guessing. So if you're unsure on test day, just take your best guess. And tonight, if you're unsure, don't worry. Once again, just take your best guess and we will go over the correct and incorrect answer choices in just a moment. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. The clear favorite here, 50% of you selected Haemophilus influenza. Second place, we had group B strep and close behind it, we had Listeria. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is C and 50% of you got it right. So we're off to a good start. Let me hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job with this question, guys. So let's take a look at what's going on, okay? So right off the bat, you know, we are hopefully getting a sense that this could be be a meningitis, right? Some abnormal um, uh, CSF findings, but also a fever, not eating, crying more. Some of those nonspecific signs that a infant who can't really tell us what they're uh, experiencing, um, what they might present with, okay? So in this case, we've got that one-year-old girl. Now in that CSF findings, we're seeing um, a decreased glucose level, an elevated white blood cell count, an increased protein and opening pressure. So these are all suggesting bacterial meningitis, okay? Now, if we take a look at the next slide, what we need to also look at is, uh, and keep in mind, are what are the most common causes of meningitis in a specific age group, okay? So this is a one-year-old patient, so she would be in that second column, okay? Strep pneumo, Neisseria meningitidis, and H influenza type B. Now you can see there at the very bottom of that table, it talks about note. The incidence of this group B strep meningitis um, has increased greatly due to screening. And then the next sentence, incidence of H influenza meningitis has decreased greatly due to the vaccination efforts. So today cases are usually seen in unimmunized children. So that would be a big risk factor for this patient for developing H influenza meningitis, okay? Um, you can see this, the other answer choices, strep pneumo and Neisseria meningitis were not even answer choices, okay? Um, the other answer choices um, are incorrect for a variety of reasons. Listeria, um, a more common cause in newborns and older adults. Um, HSV is a, a viral meningitis, so that would show uh, low white blood cell counts, normal glucose. Uh, group B strep um, is potentially a cause, um, but less likely than H influenzae in an unvaccinated patient. Um, e. coli as well, more so in uh, younger patients, children aged zero to six. It's important to keep in mind both what uh, diseases unvaccinated patients are at risk for, but also uh, by age, what are they at risk for as well. So great job with this question. Well, thank you very much, Boris. Great job. Indeed, let's move on now to our second question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices are covered up and we will begin with the lead-in. Which of the following additional findings is most likely to be found on physical examination? Which of the following additional findings is most likely to be found on physical examination? We'll give all of you a few seconds here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll move on to the vignette. All right, I see some responses coming in. Let's take a look at that vignette. 
A 17-year-old boy presents to the clinic because of fever and pain and swelling on both sides of his face between his ear and jaw. He has recently returned from an overseas trip and was in contact with someone with similar symptoms. He has not received his routine childhood immunizations. His temperature is 38.8 Celsius or 101.8 Fahrenheit. Physical examination shows swelling and tenderness of the mandibular area bilaterally. Which of the following additional findings is most likely to be found on physical examination? Paris. Thank you, Sean. So what we're gonna do is now show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and this lead in, okay? So now we're, we're still dealing with a pediatric patient, but a little, little bit older, a 17 year old boy, okay? This patient is coming in because of a few presenting signs and symptoms. Fever, pain, and swelling on both sides of the face. And they also tell us where specifically on the face. So you can kind of try to localize that a little bit, okay? Now in this case, anytime they give you any sort of travel history, any sort of social history like that, you definitely wanna make note of that. Where do they travel? Um, was that recent? And they're giving us that clue there. So you wanna make note of it, okay? And again, this patient has not received routine childhood immunizations, okay? You also wanna make note of any abnormal vital signs or physical exam signs like we've highlighted there as well. Now this question is then asking us, what additional finding is most likely to be on physical exam, okay? So I think we've got a couple steps here. I think one, we've gotta figure out what's going on in this patient, what's the condition, the diagnosis, and then two, what else might we find on physical exam, okay? So let's go ahead and let's take a look at those answer choices. And once again, we will start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, splenomegaly, D, peripheral edema, C, hepatomegaly, B, epigastric pain, and A, conjunctivitis. So once again, we're gonna go ahead and open up uh, that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you very much, Paris. The poll is open. Once again, wait until about two thirds of you have responded. Next week's topic is MSK, but please be sure to join us. All right, I see the responses coming in. Seems to be a favorite so far. Give all of you a few more moments here. Starting to get close here. All righty, well, let's take a look and see what you selected. And it was close. 29% of you selected epigastric pain and 26% of you selected conjunctivitis. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is B, epigastric pain. And 29% of you got it right. So definitely a challenging question. Let me hand it off to Boris so we can all be masters of this topic. Boris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, definitely a tough question here. So let's try to figure out what's going on in this patient, okay? This patient's got fever and swelling in the face area between the ear and the jaw where our parotid glands sit, okay? So this patient probably has parotitis, inflammation of the parotid glands, which can be caused by mumps, okay? Now this patient, as we know, has not received childhood vaccinations, so probably has not received the measles, mumps, rubella vaccination, okay? Um, if we take a look at the next slide, this kind of talks about the mumps virus and also some of the other um, uh, 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 complications or symptoms that you could develop with the mumps virus. So parotitis like our patient, or chitis, aseptic meningitis, and pancreatitis. So this patient is potentially at risk for developing pancreatitis. One of the ways that that presents is with abdominal pain, epigastric pain can often radiate to the back as well, okay? So they weren't necessarily asking us which is the complication. It would, they were taking it a step further and saying what would be a physical exam sign. So then we needed to piece together that that could be how pancreatitis presents, okay? If we take a look at the other answer choices, um, splenomegaly and hepatomegaly, um, some of the infectious causes of that would be infectious mononucleosis, cytomegalovirus, which is not what the patient has here. Um, answer choice D, peripheral edema. Um, this is also unlikely. 
um, answer choice A, conjunctivitis. Um, that's usually more so due to uh, an allergic response, uh, a viral infection, or even measles, okay? Um, if you were thinking that, keep in mind the patient would probably also have a rash, a cough, um, some other signs of measles that this patient doesn't have. So um, probably getting at mumps here, and then we needed to pick up on the next a potential complication and how that would present on physical exams. So definitely a few steps here in a tough question. Um, I'll have, uh, pass it back to you, Sean. Well, thank you very much, Boris. Definitely a challenging question. You know, if you're, if you're studying for your boards or you're in medical school and you need a little extra help, you wanna make sure you're studying the right way, make sure you're studying more efficiently. You want somebody to help you come up with a study plan. You want somebody to, you know, really help pinpoint your strengths and weaknesses reach out to us at rx-coach.com. If you're studying for your board exams, we'll start you off with one of our assessments. If you're currently in school studying for a subject-based exam or a, or, a, or a shelf exam, we'll, we'll, we'll prepare you for that, looking at your syllabus or looking at the learning objectives and what's gonna be tested. Now, students that come to us usually tell us that they got to where they wanted to be in lesser time because they had somebody with expertise guiding them and that they, aimed, they were able to achieve their goals or even beat their goals. So, you know, we've been in medical education for about 30 years. We were founded by the same people who wrote uh, First Aid, and we've had our own, uh, we have our own suite of products, right, including our, our question bank, QMAX, we've got Bricks, we've got our Flash Facts, we've got our Express videos. And so we've got a lot of experience, and we've been in medical education prior to getting into tutoring, unlike other companies. And we've also got a lot of resources as a result of what we've authored and a lot of data that we can use to really help give you a guided study plan uh, 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 with our, uh, uh, with our coaches. So, you know, if, if you think that your results aren't matching your efforts, if it's just taking you too long to get to where you're going, if you keep saying, you know, I'm studying hard, but it's just, it's just not working or I, I, I'm not quite where I want to be, or you know what, I'm already where I want to be, but I want to do even better. Reach out to us at rx-coach.com. That's rx-coach.com. Click on that free consultation tab, set up a consultation so we can talk about the program and how it can benefit you. All right, so once again, that free consultation is available at rx-coach.com. We can talk about the program and how it can benefit you. We tutor for step one and step two, Comlex one and two, as well as all basic science courses and shelves. So we look forward to hearing from you if we can be of assistance. So with that being said, let's move on now to our third and final third, third question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices are covered up and we will begin with the lead in. The vaccine against the most likely causal agent produces antibodies against which of the following bacterial components? The vaccine against the most causal agent produces antibodies against which of the following bacterial components? Once again, we'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you think this question will require. And we'll move on to that vignette. All right, I see some responses coming in. Let's take a look at that vignette. An eight-year-old girl is brought to the emergency department because of worsening difficulty breathing for the past four days. She also has a sore throat that is worse with swallowing. She has not received any scheduled childhood immunizations. Temperature is 39.7 Celsius or 103.5 Fahrenheit. Pulse is 100 per minute. Respirations are 26 per minute and blood pressure is 90 over 72. Oxygen saturation is 92% on room air. Physical examination shows inspiratory strider and respiratory distress. An x-ray film of her neck is shown in the image. The vaccine against the most likely causal agent produces antibodies against which of the following bacterial components? And with that, I'll hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So again, as you can see, we've got a pediatric patient, an eight-year-old girl, and she's coming in because of worsening difficulty breathing. And they tell us it's been going on for four days, so we get a little bit of sense of that acute chronicity, okay? They also tell us what else she has. She's got a sore throat, and it's worse with swallowing. And again, just like with a lot of these questions, social history is very important, has not received those childhood immunizations. So take note of those physical exam and vital sign findings, especially, you know, in a patient who's difficulty breathing, you want to make note of the heart rate, the respiratory rate, um, their oxygen saturation. Are they on supplemental oxygen or not? In this case, she's not. She's just on room air. 
okay, but also those respiratory exam findings as well. And here we see an x-ray of her neck, okay, so you definitely want to be able to diagnose a lot of these common x-ray conditions that they love to ask on step one. Now this question is asking us about um, the most likely causal agent, okay, but the, not just the agent, but the vaccine against it. And the vaccine against that most likely causal agent produces antibodies against what bacterial components, okay? So a few things here we've got to sort out. One, what is the most likely causal agent? Uh, two, uh, what is um, the, comp the bacterial component of which the, vac the vaccine makes antibodies against in that causal agent? So I think a two-step question here, okay? So let's go ahead and let's take a look um, at the answer choices. And once again, we're gonna go ahead and uh, start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, V capsule, D, protein A, C, polyribosyl ribitol phosphate, B, M protein, and A, IgA protease. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll, go ahead and select what you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. All right, everyone, the poll is open. This is our second to last question. And then of course we have a raffle and special offer at the end, so make sure you stick around because you must be present to win. Once again, if this is your first time joining us, please let us know in the question box and if you have certain topics you'd like us to cover in future question labs, please let us know as well. All right, give all of you a few more moments here. Well, let's take a look and see what you selected. 29% of you selected polyribosorbital phosphate, and 20% of you selected M protein. Let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed C, so definitely a challenging question. Let me hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, it's definitely a tough question, but nice job coming up with the, with the correct answer here. So um, what's going on in this patient? Um, hopefully you guys are picking up that this patient likely has epiglottitis, okay? Um, patient has high fever, inspiratory strider, um, pain on swallowing, and you can see on the lateral x-ray that the epiglottis looks enlarged, what they call the thumbprint sign, almost as if someone was pushing down with a thumb, okay? And this is uh, very characteristic of epiglottitis, uh, which is usually caused by an infection with Haemophilus influenza, okay? So if we take a look at the next slide, we can take a look at Haemophilus influenza in a first aid book, and we can see there that Haemophilus can cause epiglottitis. And you can see those arrows pointing to um, the, the, the quote thumb sign, okay? Now you can also see there on the far right column that the vaccine against Haemophilus influenza contains uh, PRP conjugated to a protein. So that is the component of the bacteria of which the vaccine is uh, uh, targeting, okay? So great job coming up with this answer. Um, taking a look at the other answer choices, um, the V capsule is the target of the vaccine against Salmonella, Typhi. Answer choice D, protein A, um, that is associated with Staph aureus. M protein um, is associated with strep pyogenes, and IgA protease is a more of a virulence factor made by a lot of respiratory pathogens, um, so not as good of answer choices there. So great job on this question as well. Well, thank you, Paros. Let's move on now to our last question of the evening. Once again, answer choices are covered up, and we'll begin with the lead-in. Biopsy specimen of the liver would most likely show which of the following findings? Biopsy specimen of the liver would most likely show which of the following findings? We'll give all of you a few moments to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require, and then we'll move on to that vignette.
All right. See some responses coming in. Let's take a look at that vignette. A 36 year old man comes to the physician because of a seven day history of an aching back, high fever, and vomiting of dark material. The patient reports that he recently returned from a safari in Western Kenya and was bitten by numerous mosquitoes. He did not receive any vaccinations prior to his travel. He does not drink alcohol. His temperature is 39 degrees Celsius or 102.2 Fahrenheit. Physical examination shows scleral icterus. Biopsy specimen of the liver would most likely show which of the following findings, virus. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we're gonna go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues here. And you know, this is our fourth time doing that. So hopefully um, you guys are kind of getting a sense of, you know, as you go through these questions, what are those clues that you need to be picking up on um, so that you're able to get this question right? And what are those clues in the actual question to make sure that you're understanding what they're asking, okay? Now, in this question, we've got a 36-year-old male, and he's coming in with some uh, uh, interesting signs of an aching back, high fever, and vomiting some dark material. This is going on for seven days. Now, again, social history, very important. He was bitten by numerous mosquitoes and just came back from Western Kenya. Okay, again, did not receive any vaccines before the travel. They give us some important vital and physical exam findings. And then they ask us, if you were to biopsy the liver, what would it most likely show? Okay, so I think we've got a couple questions here. I think one, we've got to figure out what is it that this patient has, what condition diagnosis. And then two, in that condition, if you biopsied the liver, what would you see? Okay, so I think a two-step question here as well. So once again, we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer here and we'll talk about it. Oh, sorry, let me read those answer choices. I almost forgot that. Um, so we will start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, Weibel Pilati bodies. D, Negri bodies. C, Mallory bodies. B, Dole bodies, and A, councilman bodies. So now we'll go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Well, thank you very much, Boris. I want to take a moment here to congratulate Boris also on graduating from his dermatology residency and moving on to bigger and better things, but you will still see him here on Question Labs on Tuesdays. This is our last question of the evening. Let's try to finish strong. I see the responses coming in. Give all of you a few more moments. All right. A couple more seconds here. There seems to be a clear favorite. And let's take a look and see what all of you selected. So 46% of you selected councilman bodies. So let's take a look and see if that is the correct answer. And the correct answer is councilman bodies. So strong showing here with our last question. Let me hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job, guys. Way to end strong. So let's take a look at what uh, this patient has. Um, this patient just traveled to Kenya and now kind of has some interesting findings, aching back, high fever, vomiting dark material. This is most likely yellow fever, okay? So let's take a look at the next slide. And this is kind of taking a look at some of those arboviruses or viruses transmitted um, via the mosquito vector, okay? And you can see this, that these patients often have high fever, black vomitus, jaundice, our patient had scleral icterus, remember, and then backache as well, and hemorrhage as well. And if you were to biopsy the liver, you could see councilman bodies, okay? So great job on picking up on this. It's um, a pretty in-depth question, so great job to you guys. Let's take a look at the other answer choices and what those are referring to. So Weibel Pilati bodies, those are in the endothelium. They release von Willebrand's factor, as well as other components. Negri bodies are pathognomonic for rabies infections. Mallory bodies are what you'd see in the liver in patients with alcoholic hepatitis usually. And dull bodies are found in neutrophils, uh, fighting off infections. So the best answer choice here, like you guys picked, is A. So great job 
on today's questions. I'll hand it back to you, Sean. Well, thank you very much, Boris. Definitely some challenging questions tonight. If you want to take a deeper dive into these questions and make sure you've mastered the concepts tonight, make note of these QIDs, take a picture, jot them down, take a screenshot. You can simply enter these into the Rx search field and within a, a USMLE Rx, these questions will pop right up for you. So I'll give you a few seconds here to make note of these QIDs.